This morning we want to have our fourth look and final look at the life of Elisha, and we particularly want to look at that incident of Elisha in Dothan that we read in 2 Kings, and we find it there in verse uh, chapter 6 uh, from verses 8 to 23. And the title for our meditation is simply Elisha in Dothan. Yesterday we looked at Elisha with Naaman, and we noticed the wonderful effect that it had upon Nahum, that not only was he healed of his leprosy, but we are inclined to believe that his soul was also saved, and he went back to Samaria to his master, a changed man, not just as far as his skin and physical health was concerned, but that his soul was right uh, with God. Well, whatever effect Naaman had when he returned to his king and master, it did seem to us that it soon wore off. Because our narrative that we want to look at, beginning at verse 8, then the king of Syria warred against Israel. We notice there's no mention of Naaman. Maybe he had gone the way of all the earth, that is possible. Or maybe he had decided that he was no longer going to fight against the people of God. Having experienced the grace of God, and having come to be a, a servant in some sense of the Lord, he was not going to fight against God's people. Whatever. It didn't have a, too much a great effect upon the king, because he was on his raids again. He was warring against Israel. And of course, we would remind ourselves that this was of the Lord. This was part of the prophecy that God had given to Elijah, that because of Israel's apostasy and because they had embraced idolatry, he was going to raise up enemies who would chastise his people. And this is exactly what the king of Syria was doing. And when we look at these things and when we try to interpret them, when we try to get a grip of what God is actually saying to us in the, this Word, we must always remember the original audience. First and Second Kings were written to a, a particular audience at a particular time for a particular purpose. And we are of the opinion that these books were written to the captives who were in Babylon. And it was written that they might understand why they were in Babylon. Because many of them may well be in Babylon, and they may well be wondering about the great God of their forefathers. And they may have heard about the terrible things and the mighty things that the Lord God had done for His people in time past. But now here were the people of God in bondage and in captivity in Babylon. And they may well be wondering, has God got a purpose and a plan for us? Is God able to do things? Has God in some sense been defeated? Has His plans been over, overhauled by the acts of the nations? And particularly the act of King Nebuchadnezzar who raised Jerusalem to the ground. And these are the kind of thoughts that would have been going through the, the, those who were in captivity. Well, this book was, or these books were written to remind them and to explain to them why they were in captivity. It was not because the Lord had lost interest in them or He was not powerful enough to deliver them. They were there because of idolatry. And these books were written to encourage them that they might wait upon the Lord, that they might understand what particularly the prophet Jeremiah had said, that their captivity would last for 70 years, and then they would be restored. So rather than showing the weakness of God, it was revealing the greatness and the glory of God to them, and that it might stir them up, that they would trust upon the Lord, 
and that they would do or make the best of it while they were in Babylon, realizing that ultimately they would come out and they would be restored. Today, as we draw our conference to a close, I do hope that the Word of God will encourage the people of God. We do need to be encouraged. And here we have a wonderful incident in the life of Elisha and his servant that surely does encourage the people of God. I want to draw four things from this narrative. I want to say four things about Elisha. And the first thing we want to notice <coughs> about Elisha is that he warns. Verse 9 in Second Kings chapter 6, verse 9, And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. The Syrians were sending raiding parties, and they had decided they would go to one particular place. Elisha would warn the king of Israel, don't go there, because if you go there, you will be ambushed. If you go there, you will meet with the Syrians. If you go there, there will be bloodshed. If you go there, you will fight and not necessarily win. So, obviously, the king avoided that place. And that happened on a number of occasions, so that Ben-Hadad, we're, we're inclined to believe the king would be Ben-Hadad of Syria at this time, he gathered together his hosts. He had a war cabinet, and he was utterly frustrated. Here was this proud king, and he was sending his hosts out, but every time they were foiled. There was no one to fight. There was no one to ambush. And he asked his people, will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He assumed there was a traitor in the camp, and someone rightly responded by saying to the king in the council, none, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Here we have the prophet then revealing the word of God to the king, and the king acting promptly upon that word, and as a result, Israel was delivered. And here we have friends, uh, we might say religion, provo pro proving a national safeguard. Elisha brings the word of the Lord to the king. The king obeys, and tremendous blessing follows as a result. And this is, could be described and could be used to describe the relationship between the church and the state. The church should render to the state the service which Elisha rendered to the king of Israel. The state has the need of the church. And indeed, when the church is loyal to her master, she is able to lift up her voice and say with authority, thus saith the Lord, concerning any particular issue that might be facing the nation. And this is indeed something that the church should do and should bring to bear upon the life of the nation and those who lead and govern us. Thus says the Lord, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about a particular policy? What does the Bible say about this particular war or whatever? The church should be able to go to the leaders who rule and govern over us and tell them from the Word of God how they should act and how they should respond in any particular situation. Well, I realize as I bring this to you this morning that most of you, and if not all of you, would certainly readily and heartily agree with this, that this is a vital role that the church has, that it should raise up its voice and declare it uh, concerning matters that affect the nation, that the nation might hear what God has to say. And this is the duty and the responsibility of the church. And of course, it is incumbent upon our leaders to listen, to observe, and to act. When the Word of God is brought to bear upon them, they are ones who must be 
held accountable, and they must put into practice what the church says, provided they speak according to God's Word. But with all due respect to all gathered here, I don't believe there are many presidents here. I don't believe there are many prime ministers or senators or whatever here this morning. But there are lessons. There are some things that we can derive for ourselves from this principle. Surely then the first thing that we should derive from this, that it is the duty of the preacher to warn. The preacher must warn. Elisha indeed was God's appointed prophet and representative in Israel at that time. And those who follow him in his footsteps, although they are not prophets in the sense that he was a prophet, yet nevertheless the minister of the gospel is one who has been charged to bring forth the Word of God, to reveal God's will as we find it in the Word of God. And of course, he will have a variety of subjects and topics to address. He will be there to teach and to proclaim the gospel. He will be there to encourage and to exhort. He will be there to bring forth the, the love of God as we see it in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there is an element in the preacher's life and ministry that he must uh, be diligent about. He must warn people. He must warn them. John the Baptist said to the scribes and the Pharisees who came to him to be baptized, Who has warned thee from the wrath that is to come? And therefore, friends, it is important that we must be warned, that we must indeed hear the warnings that we find in the Scripture. And of course, we go to the Lord Jesus Christ, who was that ultimate preacher. No man ever spake like this man, uh, the church officer said when they went to arrest him and when they came back empty-handed. They were amazed at his words. No man ever spoke like this man, and no one ever preached like the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, friends, if you look at his teaching and if you look at his preaching, it is wonderful and glorious, but you will find there are many warnings in his preaching. We love to think about the world that is to come, that awaits the Christian. It's a very profitable thing to meditate upon heaven, upon what awaits the people of God. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there ye may be also. That's what he said to his disciples who were troubled. He reminded them of the glorious end that awaited them, and that he was going to prepare that place for them by going to Calvary and offering up himself that once for all perfect sacrifice of himself. But although the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about heaven, if you search the Scriptures, you will find that he spoke more on hell. I once read a book, I'm sure many of you have read it also, Whatever Has Happened to Hell. It seems to be erased from the modern church. We don't think about it. We don't preach about it. We don't warn people about it. We have no great desire, friends, to, in any sense, frighten people but we do want to inform, and we do want to warn. Because at the end of the day, friends, whether we like it or not, it is either heaven or hell. It's either with Christ 
or it is with the devil and his angels. It is either eternal bliss and happiness and blessedness and light and purity and holiness, or it is an eternity, not a time, not an age, not ages, but eternity, no respite whatsoever, no change in our circumstances, eternally to be in that place of torment. Now, whatever it means, and we cannot be dogmatic about it, but we must realize it is a place of absolute torment. It is a place where our consciences shall be working overtime when we consider the glorious privileges and opportunities that we've spurned, when we think about the gospel sermons we've heard, when we've thought about the, the conferences we've attended and the church services we've attended, and when, we, when we've heard prayers being offered up in order that we might be saved, and we've spurned all of them, and we're in that place of torment, our conscience indeed will condemn us. We know something of this. Our conscience indeed is a powerful thing. And when our conscience is troubled, we must deal with it. But there we'll not be able to deal with it. Our conscience will continue to do its work throughout all eternity without respite, without any mitigation whatsoever. And surely, if anyone must warn you about this, it must be the preacher, because no one else will do it. No one else will open this up. No one else will remind you, friends, that by, by default, we're all on that broad road that leads to destruction. We don't need to do anything. That's where we'll end up. There is another way. There is a way of escape. And the preacher must warn people to flee from the wrath to come. People might say, this is terrible. Surely a, a God of love would never do this. Surely He would never punish people eternally. If we think like that, there are at least two things wrong with our thinking and our doctrine. We haven't grasped the holiness of God. Early on in my Christian life, when I spoke to my first minister about the call to the ministry, and in discussion, he said a number of things, and some things I forgot, and other things stick in your mind. And one thing he said, which did stick in my mind, get your doctrine of God right. Get it right. Get to know your God. And once you know your God, you will be saved from many errors. And the, the church is littered with errors because they do not realize and they, they cannot grasp, even from Scripture itself, the absolute holiness of God. And this is our problem with us. When we balk at the, the thought that God, a loving God, could send people to hell, we don't realize that sin indeed is a terrible heinous thing in the sight of God. And there are two things that are, that are wrong with the, with the modern church and with modern Christianity and with the people in general. They have no real concept of God's burning holiness and of His hatred of sin. And once we have a better understanding of these things, then we will understand why God will indeed send those Christ rejectors to that terrible, 
terrible place. Well, the preacher must warn, but there's only so much the preacher can do. The hearers must heed. The king of Syria, the king of Israel, I should say, was someone who at this particular occasion actually listened to Elisha. We know on many other occasions he didn't listen to Elisha, but he did. Well, if a preacher must warn, that's all he can do. The hearers must heed. They must take on board these things. And if the, if the hearers are concerned at all about what the preacher says, they must go to the Word of God themselves, and they must be like the Bereans when they tested what the Apostle Paul was saying. They must go to the Scriptures and to see if these things are found in the Scriptures. And if they are found in the Scriptures, they must recognize that the words that the preachers are saying is not his own word. It is the word of the living God. This is what you'll find in God's word. And this is why preaching the gospel is so important. This is God's final complete revelation to mankind. This is His message above all messages that He wants to bring to mankind, that we're lost, we're perishing by nature, and we need a Savior, and that Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. He alone can save. He alone did say, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. No one will get to heaven except through the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll never get to heaven by attending conferences. We'll never get to heaven by following our parents or trusting in them or trusting in ministers. We'll never get to heaven by simply reading the Bible or praying, good as these things are. We must embrace Jesus Christ. He must be our Lord and He must be our Savior. He must save us. He must. And we must heed what we hear. Secondly, if Elisha warns, Elisha himself is fearless. Verse 16, he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. The servant of Elisha went out one morning. And what did he see? He saw a host, chariots, horses, soldiers, round about Dothan, because the king of Syria had decided that they were going to find out where Elisha was. And then, when he found out that he was in Dothan, he was going to send a great host to capture this poor prophet an army to capture one man. From a worldly point of view, if the king of Syria was half wise, he would have sought out Elisha, certainly, and would have tried to get him on his side. Would it not be great to have someone like Elisha on your side, someone who could be a traitor and help you. But this man indeed instead thought, I shall go and capture him. Did he not realize that the same way as Elisha was able to tell where he was going to send his army, that Elisha would know that he was coming for him and he was looking for him? Nevertheless, he sent his army, and they found him, and they surrounded Dothan with the intent that they would capture him and take him back to Syria. And when this was conveyed to Elisha, he said to his servant, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. What was the secret of Elisha's 
fearlessness? Well, it's quite simply, he was one who feared the Lord. You remember that time when Jesus sent out his disciples two by two? He sent out the seventy, and he warned them not to fear man. Instead, that they were to fear God. They were not to fear the one who could kill the body, but instead they were to fear that one who is able to cast body and soul into hell. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ recognized that His disciples, being human, being frail, they might well be filled with the fear of man, and they might be, in some sense, reluctant to go out and to face men and to bring the gospel to them. And how were they going to overcome this fear that they had of men? Well, they were to overcome it by the fact that they were to be immersed in the fear of God. And you know, friends, someone who fears God will not fear man. And this is what dominated the life of Elisha. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13 says this verse, you will know it, quote, Sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself, and let Him be your fear, and let Him be your dread. Christian, as you leave this conference, maybe you have been in some sense edified, you've enjoyed the, the preaching and the fellowship, and the whole thing has been refreshing for you, and you have in some sense been fortified, we trust and hope, but you're going back to situations that maybe will test you and try you. How are you going to respond? You must sanctify the Lord God of hosts Himself. Let Him be your fear, and let Him be your dread. We could quote another verse from Isaiah, which is apt and appropriate for what we want to say this morning. In Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4, quote, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. These verses could have been written for Elisha, Things didn't look good for him. He was just one man and a servant, and a whole host was around about him. What could he possibly do in his own strength? Absolutely nothing. Yet he was absolutely fearless. Absolutely. Because he was immersed, because he was taken over with the fear of God. Friends, this is something we want to captivate. This is something we want to aspire to that as we go out, as we leave this conference and its security and its shelter, and as we go into a hostile world, let us fear God. Let us cultivate this holy, reverential fear of God. Let us remind ourselves again, go back to this doctrine of God. Let us remind ourselves that our God is sovereign that He's powerful. No, He's all-powerful. And that nothing will happen to the people of God but by permission. How will you then cope when you are surrounded with your enemies? The Christian has many enemies. I'm not particularly talking about people because we must remind ourselves that, as Christians, we're in a spiritual warfare. What does Ephesians teach us? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Christian, you are a soldier. Christian, you are in a war. Christian, you are in an a all-out, 24-hour, 7-day week, 365 days of the year. You are at battle, at war against spiritual forces. You have your own wicked heart to deal with. And indeed, the more that you grow in grace, the more you recognize this wicked heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You don't even know your own heart. 
you may know something about it. That's true. And as you grow in grace, you will know more of it. And the more you know of it, you, you will be less proud of it. But the verse or the Scripture goes on to say something like this, that although we do not know our hearts, the Lord knows our hearts. He knows it. And He's able to test it and to try the reins. We have a wicked heart, and it's still with us. And we have to fight against it, the sin that is within us. It can easily manifest itself. The flesh will war against the Spirit. This is what you're up against. You have, of course, the world. The world can be subtle. The world's a hostile place. We're, in, we're on enemy territory. And the world would seek to drag us along with them, with their mindset, with their thinkings, with their philosophies. We have to war against these things. We are not to be taken in with the world. We are not to love the world. For if the love of the world is in us, the love of the Father is not in us. And then, of course, we have the devil himself. We don't want to preach up the devil, but we must be aware that there is a world around about us. There's a spiritual world all around us. And we must believe in this devil. The Bible, in one sense, doesn't make sense unless we believe in the devil, that one who is the enemy of God and the enemy of all God's people. And he is out and out and determined to bring down the Christian, to cause havoc in homes, to cause decline and declension in churches. He's active. Whenever the gospel's proclaimed, he's there. He's a wonderful church goer. You only have to have to look at the parable of the, the sower. There, what do we find? The devil comes along and takes away the seed before it has any chance of bearing fruit in the hearts and the lives of individuals who hear the gospel. He is diligent, he's earnest, he's serious, he's a constant menace. And we must war against him. And of course, we realize that we do not do this in of ourselves. We have the great help of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes our enemies can come like the host here, this around us. All these enemies come upon us at one time. And maybe when we leave occasions like this, it's maybe then when we go back to our own situations that we find the battle is at its strongest. Again, friends, remember the original audience. You can imagine how this would encourage them in captivity, in bondage, looking back, wondering what it was like Will it ever be the same again? They are to be fearless, and they are to stand and wait upon the Lord, and He will indeed uh, deliver them. So, secondly then, Elisha, fearless. Thirdly, we want to notice Elisha, confident. Verse 17, for instance, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. Why was Elisha so confident? Why was he so fearless? You see, many people can be fearless. We think of the Islamic terrorist. He goes to wherever he wants to go, and he, he wants to blow up people. His religion will tell him that if he does this, 
If he dies a martyr, then Allah will welcome him. He will have a place in heaven or paradise. And the moment that he dies, he will be transported by Abraham into, the, into paradise. And there he will enjoy sensual pleasures with celestial virgins. This is what he's told, and this is what he believes, and this is what makes him so fearless that he's prepared to blow himself up and to blow up multitudes with him. But of course, you and I know that his fearlessness has no ground. There is no confidence in what he does. There's no hope. And of course, if he carries on like that, if he actually performs what he intends to do, he will not in any sense wake up in paradise, but he shall instantly find himself in hell itself. The Bible talks about the hypocrite. The hypocrite has a hope. In the book of Job, chapter 20, verse 5, it says that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. The joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. The hypocrite may be in some sense fearless, and he may be confident of his hope. But soon the hypocrite will know that he has no confidence. His hope is not based upon reality. It's not based upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Elisha was so confident that his whole hope was built upon the great God of Israel. And of course, we would remind ourselves that when Elijah was taken up into heaven, Elisha was there, and he saw the chariots and the fire. He saw the chariots of fire. He had that glorious experience. He saw his master being taken up to heaven in glory and in splendor. And that vision remained with Elisha. And Elisha recognized and knew that he was God's appointed representative for that time. And he knew and enjoyed the protection of the living God. And he was one who was well aware that around him was a spiritual world, a world that he, he couldn't see with his eyes, but he could see with the eye of faith. And he wanted his servant to enjoy that same experience and for the Lord to open up his eyes that he would not just see the chariots and the horses, but he would see all around him that there were others. There was a mighty army about with Elisha. And here, surely, there is a lesson for us. Here we find someone, Elisha, a man of faith, and a man who was enjoying his faith. He was having a security in his faith. Here we might say godliness, enjoying a gracious security. And this is one of the, of the benefits that should be known and felt among the people of God. Life may be very uncertain. We may not know, and we certainly do not know, one day from the next. But we know the Lord. Our hope and our confidence is in our great God and in our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not in ourselves. And we trust upon Him. Does not the Bible say, The eternal God is thy refuge. The eternal God. The God who is from everlasting to everlasting without beginning of days or end of days. He is our refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. This is a promise. This is true to every single one of us. 
If we have faith, even the faith the size of a thimbleful, if we have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is your promise. This is for you. Did not the Lord Jesus say, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish? Never perish? If the Lord Jesus was to lose one of His sheep, we could not call Him the Savior. He would be a failure but because He has promised that He will save all whom the Father has given unto Him, He will bring them all to glory, every single one. They shall be found complete on that great day. This is to encourage us. This is that we might wait upon the Lord. You might be going through difficulties and trials. Maybe not now. Maybe when you go back. Maybe in a month or two or a year or two, whatever. We know that uh, these things are common for the people of God. They will face difficulties and trials, and they will be stretched. But we must realize and grasp and take this into our experience that the Lord watches over all His people. There is the ministry of angels which we're largely ignorant of. And they are ministering spirits sent to those who are heirs of salvation. Maybe in glory we will know more and we will marvel at the way that God has preserved His people. John, in 1 John, says much the same. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, quote, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Who is in you? Christ in you, the hope of glory. He dwells in us by his Spirit. Who is in the world? It is the devil and his angels. But, friends, greater is he that is in you. Oh, Christian, that you would bask in this security, that you would bask in in this, that you might have confidence in your God. And maybe you have confidence in your God, but the time will come maybe when that confidence shall be tested, as it was here, for Elisha and particularly for his servant that his eyes were opened up. Oh, do our eyes not need to be opened up more and more? Well, there we have, thirdly, Elisha confident. Finally, fourthly, Elisha victorious. And we would find this from verses 18 to verses 23. Elisha prays, and his servant's eyes are opened, and the soldier's eyes are closed. The soldier's eyes are closed. Elisha wins a victory without the shedding of blood. What a tremendous victory. His servant's eyes are opened, and he prays further that... The soldier's eyes might be closed to some extent. They were not, of course, completely blind. They were to follow Elisha, and they followed him to Samaria. And once they were found in Samaria, their eyes were opened, and they were handed over to the king of Israel, who wanted to defeat them and to destroy them. But instead, Elisha said, feed them and then send them back to their master. What a victory. Not a drop of blood shed. Elisha, indeed, was totally victorious. We're inclined to think that what happened afterwards when the king of Syria again 
sought to capture Samaria and besieged it and caused a severe famine, would teach us that the king of Israel blamed Elisha for the siege, because if the king of Israel had destroyed the soldiers that had come to Samaria, they would not be able then to regroup and come and besiege Samaria on another occasion. And because Elisha was lenient with them, the king of Israel was blaming Elisha for the siege and for the famine. But what we want to notice here, friends, is that Elisha, on this occasion, was victorious. No, no bloodshed, nothing. Everything was peaceful. And as we've said on another occasion, we do think that Elisha, if he's not particularly a type of Christ, it surely does mention or bring to our attention uh, the gospel. Well, as Elisha here brought victory without the shedding of blood, the Lord Jesus Christ brought a greater victory, but it did require the shedding of blood. It required His shedding. And of course, when we say the shedding of blood, we ultimately mean it meant His death. Because the Lord Jesus Christ had shed His blood at circumcision, and He had shed His blood when He sweated great drops of blood at Gethsemane. And had it stopped there, there would be no good news, and there would be no victory. He had to die. His blood had to be shed in death. And that, friends, is the most glorious victory of all. That is our hope. That is what we rest upon. He died because we will not die. He suffered the wrath of God. He was condemned. He suffered the pains of hell in order that His people would know nothing of these things. That's why it tells us in Romans chapter 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. No condemnation, because Christ has shed His blood and won that great and glorious victory over sin, over death, over devil, the devil himself. As Elisha was victorious, let us delight and glory in the victory of Jesus Christ. And let us partake of it by having Him as our Lord and Savior. Elisha warns, Elisha fearless, Elisha confident, and Elisha victorious. Amen. And may God bless His Word to us. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank Thee for thy, our time around Thy Word. And as we conclude our time, we ask for Thy blessing to follow. And again, we pray that we might have grace to seriously consider these things. Help us. Give us, we ask, a love for the truth and a love for Thy Word, and above all, a love for the God of the Word. We hear our prayers. Be with us now as we conclude in praise. For Jesus' sake, amen.